If you're a homeowner, you may have seen a site somewhat like what I have on the screen today. If you've ever planted a sapling, that sapling oftentimes will have a tendency to go in a direction that you don't want it to go, meaning by that that it's going to have a lean to it. So oftentimes what will happen is there will be tension placed on each side of the sapling, such as in this picture where the chains are pulling the sapling in either direction so that the result is that it is going straight. That's how a tree is straightened, and in a symbolic way, that's how we're straightened also. Many times when we hear the word tension used, we don't think about it in a positive sense. We think about tension as being a time maybe when emotions are getting out of control or people are getting a bit angry with each other. But there are times when tension is very good, and that is certainly the case when it comes to our relationship with God. And so in our study today, what I'd like to do is to talk about this tension that we have in this relationship, to understand that there are two directions that God is giving us that help us to find the way to Him. As we think about this idea, perhaps the verse in the Bible that best illustrates this is found in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, the apostle says, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Later in our study, we'll come back and talk a bit about the context of this passage, but for now, let's simply note the tension that we have in it two sides that are helping us to maintain our spiritual straightness. First of all, you'll notice that the apostle speaks of the kindness of God. Anytime we come across the term kindness in the Bible, it's going to always have a very concrete concept associated with it. And what I mean by that is, is kindness is much more than a feeling. It is something that is a result of that feeling. It's doing something in a very concrete fashion. And so as we think here about the kindness of God, in this particular place in the Bible, the apostle is talking about that kindness in that God has done the very right thing for us at exactly the right time. We're talking about salvation issues here. So here is the kindness of God that has been provided, that has given a very concrete way so that we can find salvation. So that's one side of the tension. But notice that the apostle talks about the other side of this tension, and that's the word severity. When we come to the word severity in this passage, what it means is to be cut off. Now, that's not a tapering down or a gradual cutting off. It is the word itself describing an abruptness. And you'll notice that in this passage. He says, you need to note the severity of God. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. So God says, on the one hand, I have provided the way of salvation for you in my kindness. On the other hand, there is a severity if you reject that offer. He says, you need to understand that that is the only way to an association with me. So let's illustrate this. Let's imagine ourselves as the tree. And we've got two tensions that are helping us to be straight. On the one side, we have the kindness of God. On the other side, we have the severity of God, both absolutely necessary, both keeping us in tension so that we are not drifting one way or the other in our relationship with God. Now, to amplify this point a bit more, I want us to understand that Romans is not the first place that we come across this tension. In fact, there are a number of passages in the Bible where we find that. But let me illustrate it with just two. If we go all the way back to the book of Exodus, we're going to find this tension of God. Let's note, first of all, the kindness aspect. Here, as Moses has wanted to see the Lord, and as the Lord now is passing by and allowing Moses to at least get a glimpse of him, as he passes, this is the proclamation that's made. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So here we are all the way back in the book of Exodus, but yet still we're talking about the salvation of God. Here he is forgiving iniquity. Here he is forgiving transgression and sin. Why? Because of the kindness of his nature, his mercy, his grace, his long-suffering, his love, his faithfulness. All of these things are preparing the way so that the concrete illustration of his kindness can come about. But let's notice the other side of the tension. Because he goes on to say, I will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generations. So God is now saying, if my kindness is rejected, that iniquity is going to have a consequence. There is going to be a penalty for that sin. And the idea that he gives here is, I'm not going to forget about it. I'm not going to punish the first generation. And then as generations follow in their wickedness, I just kind of forget it. No, he says, that iniquity is going to bring about this visitation of consequence on all of the generations that wickedly try to turn away from me. Again, note the tension. The kindness on one hand, the severity on the other. Let's look at one more illustration of this. And this being from the words of Jesus himself. And we're going to reverse our order on this. Let's note, first of all, the severity when Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So God says, here Jesus himself in his own words as he walks the earth says, You need to understand the severity of turning against God. There are people on this earth who can kill our bodies. But he says there is only one who can destroy both, both body and soul in hell. And you need to be aware of that. But yet that's not where Jesus leaves it. He gives us the tension because he goes ahead and he talks about how the Lord knows what's going on, how he understands everything about us, even to the number of hairs on our head. And then he says, fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. The Lord is saying here, God wants to destroy no one. God wants to send no one to hell. And because of that, he is very willing to demonstrate his kindness, to demonstrate his love in the value that he places on each and every one of us. So here again, we've got the picture of the kindness and the severity of God. As I noted earlier, there are many places in the Bible where we can make this point. We can look at illustrations of people's lives and find that also. But these suffice. They show us what we're wanting to know in this tension. Now, that then brings us to the idea of why it is so important that we understand this tension. Why it is absolutely essential that if we are going to understand God, that we must understand this tension that's helping to keep us where we need to be. If we view God as only being severe, if we only note the severity of God, the visiting of iniquity, the sending body and soul to hell, we are going to get a very distorted image of God. Why is that? Well, if you'll remember our study last week, we talked about those who will view the God of the Old Testament, so to speak, as this angry, vengeful, impetuous deity. Those are people who only understand one side of the tension. As the Bible is read, the only thing that's focused on is when God is striking someone down or when God is allowing his people to be defeated or another people to be wiped out. That's the only picture that they have of God. Well, to understand that is not to understand God. To understand only one side of this is not to know who he is. This concept is very well illustrated in one of the parables of Jesus. If you'll recall the parable of the talents, 
the, the focus of this parable pretty much is on the man who only receives one talent. And because of that and because of his nature and his timidity, he buries the talent. He does not take it out and do what the master told him to do. I'd like for us to note the exchange now between the one talent man and the master. The man said, who had received the one talent, said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. So here the man says, and I'm paraphrasing of course, but he says, all I know about you is your severity. I know that you try to gather where you don't sow. I know that, that you try to reap where you've not planted. Therefore, what I have done out of my fear of you, I went and buried the talent so that nothing would happen to it, and here it is. That's a distorted view of the master. How do I know that? Because in the parable, the other two men flourish in their dealings with the master. And the master praises them for what they've done. But interestingly, in the parable, the Lord allows the master to answer the man by his own terms. Listen to what he says. His master said to him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. I don't think the master is actually saying this is who he is. But he's answering the man in that image that the man had of him. And so what he's saying is, well, if you knew I was a guy who uh, went out and I reaped where I hadn't sown or I gathered where I hadn't planted, shouldn't you have reacted in a very different way? In other words, your distorted view of me has caused you to be paralyzed with fear. That is the danger of viewing only the severity of God. Well, let's turn that around. If I do not understand that at times there is a severity to God, that also gives me a distorted image of Him. In other words, if I view God as this rather benign deity who, in the concept of kindness, we kind of have that grandmotherly image, the, the one who really overlooks everything and gives you a cookie no matter what you've done, if we view God in that way, Again, we're going to have the distorted image of him. This image will give us the idea that there really is no hell. And there are a lot of people in the religious world who have chosen to view only this side of God. And therefore, when polls are taken and religious people are asked, do you believe there's a heaven? The percentage is very, very high. But if the question is asked, is there a hell, that percentage drops dramatically because there are people who do not want to see the severe side of God, to understand that there is something that happens if we do not accept it. And so that would then lead to the idea that there are really no standards. If God is just simply this benign deity, if God is simply this deity who, who kind of looks down on us and, and really just excuses everything, well, it doesn't matter what we do. And if we come to the conclusion that standards do not matter, then we understand that we have a God on our hands who is not going to enforce any requirement. Now, if you imagine that sapling that we talked about at the first of the lesson, and if you break one of those lines of tension, that sapling is not going to grow in the right direction. And that's the same for us. If I view God only as severe... Or if I view God as totally lacking severity, I am not going to grow the way I need to. And so that's why those two lines of tension provide a complete understanding of God. To show us that God is all love, to show us that God is kind, but to also show us that there is a consequence for not obeying. Now when I accept that, I then grow straight up, spiritually speaking. I become the kind of person who's going to understand God in the way God wants to understand. And if we put this in the words of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle would say, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up 
in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. You see, with the two lines of tension, the kindness and the severity, we are growing up to be like Jesus. We're not going to go in the wrong direction. With all of this said now, and our understanding of these two lines of tension, we then must ask ourselves, how am I going to respond to this tension? In looking at the things that God has told us, in looking at the two sides of his tension, how am I going to respond to that? Well, let's begin this point by first of all understanding the kindness that God has shown. We said that it's always concrete. Well, let's look at the concrete action. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Here is kindness. Here is the concrete action that we were dead in our trespasses. By the kindness of God, we have been made alive together with Christ. Let's add one more passage to this. Still from the apostle, this time writing to Titus. He says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now let's take both of these passages and put them together. And here we find God our Savior, the Father. Here we find Jesus Christ. Here we find the Holy Spirit. So in other words, what we're looking at is Father, Son, and Spirit giving the greatest act of kindness possible in giving us the opportunity to be forgiven of our sins. Here is the kindness of God. Now when we understand that, that then means that the offer is given to us, this kind act, Father, Son, and Spirit has provided for us. So how am I going to deal with that? Well, we understand that there is a condition in our relationship with God. Let's go back to Romans chapter 11 and we'll see that. He says, understand, note the kindness and severity of God. But in that same passage, he says, you're going to understand this, the kindness aspect, if you continue. In His kindness. We just defined what that kindness is. It's a salvation that we're offered. Here is this great act of salvation. Father, Son, and Spirit who have with with great uh, love for us provided the way of escape. But the apostle says this kindness is for you if you continue. When we look at that word continue, it means a persistence. In other words, it's not a one and done. We don't become a Christian and then put it on the shelf and we're done with it. Here is a persistence in our relationship with God. Here is a persistence in the continuation of what we're doing. Now let's go back to our context of Romans chapter 11. In the context, the apostle is saying, there were Jews, many of them, who God cut off. He says, these were Jews who had been given the great gift of kindness. But yet when they looked at Jesus Christ, they were offended by him and they refused to follow. And God says, well, if you don't accept my kindness, you're going to be cut off. But the Gentiles who did accept that kindness have been grafted into the tree. And so here are the wild branches being brought in to the to the trunk of that tree to become a part of that tree. So on the one hand, you've got the kindness that's shown to the Gentiles. On the other hand, you've got the severity that's being shown to the Jews who are being cut off. And so the apostle is making this point to the Gentiles is you better pay attention to what's going on. He says, don't think 
that the God who cut off these Jews from the tree will not also cut you off if you do not continue in his kindness. The Gentiles needed to see the tension. They needed to understand the kindness on the one hand, the severity on the other hand, that's keeping them going in the straight direction. So the apostle says, you must continue in the faith. You must understand this is what God expects of you. If I can borrow something from our current times, there's a lot of talk these days about privilege. Well, let me just say this. The apostle is telling us there is no Christian privilege in the sense that you can somehow become a Christian and then you can live however you want and everything's going to be okay. No, he's telling the Gentiles straight out, you understand that you must continue in the kindness of God and that's humbly accepting Him, loving Him for what He's done, loving Him as your God. That's what the apostle is telling us. And it behooves every one of us to pay very close attention to that. That while God is patient and merciful on the one hand, on the other hand, there is a severity for those who push Him. There's a severity for those who will try to take that mercy and use it in an unjust way. But let's look at another side of this also. Not only do we find the continuation of the kindness in our relationship with God, which I think is the primary intention, but there's also a tension in the condition with our relationship with one another. We cannot continue in the kindness of God and not be kind to those around us. And so, as we consider this, we're going to go back to a passage, again, that we viewed last week in our study. And this being from 1 Corinthians 13, where we're going to find the idea of continuing in that kindness. You'll recall that as Paul begins to describe love, the very first thing he said is, love is patient. And and I said then, perhaps he's starting out with the hardest thing. Because patience is oftentimes tested, and many, many folks, perhaps all, struggle with that. But this week, I want us to note what he attaches to that. Love is patient and kind. So if I'm continuing in the kindness of God, it means I accept God as my Savior and never fail to show my love and appreciation for that. But part of that showing of appreciation is how I'm treating other people. And thus the apostle says, when you are showing love, the way you show love is in showing kindness. And that echoes the same thing he told to the Ephesians when he said, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Here again is the tie. If we're continuing in the kindness of God, then we are continuing in the kindness of our relationship to each other. Be kind to one another. Love is kind. Now, as I begin to consider how I treat others, one of the things that is essential, if I am going to be able to show kindness, is to absolutely rid my life of pride. That is a very difficult thing to do. And once again, I'd like to bring this into the context of our present day uh, troubles that are going on. A lot of times anymore, we're hearing about white pride, or black pride, or Latino pride. We must understand that any time we associate the word pride with a cause, we are heading in the wrong direction because the whole idea behind pride is a lifting up. And yet what has God said? He says, humble yourselves and let me do the lifting. As Christians, we perhaps can influence society a bit. We certainly need to try, but if the last 2,000 years have proven anything, 
we're not going to have a dramatic influence in getting people on the right road in a massive kind of uh, turnaround way. But yet, as we consider our relationships with one another, we must understand this point. That when we come into Jesus Christ, color blindness must follow. Ethnicity blindness must follow. We're not seeing one another in terms of these groups that are kind of competing against each other. And this group has pride and this group has pride. And that's leading them into to conflict. No, for, for us, for Christians, we understand that we do not deserve anything God has given us. God has been kind. And because of that kindness, we in turn are going to be kind. Let's leave all of this foolishness at the door. Let's leave all of this foolishness of thinking I'm better because of the color of my skin, something that I had nothing to do with, by the way. And let's concentrate on the idea of how I can humbly serve my fellow man, regardless of me, regardless of him as far as any kind of color or ethnicity or economics is concerned. And find the humility of Jesus Christ to be the kind of person who's growing up to be like our head, Jesus. And let me also remind us, that kindness is always seen in concrete actions. Do we understand that kindness is much more than good intentions? I don't know who said it, but it was an apt saying that the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. The things that we intend to do, the things that we're going to get around to, the things that one of these days will transpire, those are not acts of kindness. Simply thinking is not going to get me where God wants me to be. Aren't we happy that God did not leave salvation simply as a one of these days thought? But Father, Son, and Spirit working in unity provided that plan for us. And therefore, those good intentions must be translated into actions that when I see the opportunity, kindness pursues. I don't have to wait to be told or by sorrow driven, as the old hymn says. I don't have to wait for somebody to take me by the hand and say, here is an act of kindness you can perform. Certainly, if that happens, I need to do it. But I need to be the kind of person who is looking, who's seeking, who's wanting the opportunity and then pursuing with action. That's continuing in the kindness of God. Let me also mention that there is also a place for demonstrating severity. But with a very large asterisk, we say, This always proceeds with caution. God is the judge, and God meets out vengeance. Therefore, he says, don't allow yourself to get involved in hypocritical judgments. Judge not that you be not judged, is that idea of hypocrisy. He says, you do good to your enemy, vengeance is mine. But there are occasions where God has said, I'm going to allow you in a small way to demonstrate my vengeance in order to bring someone back. Let's illustrate this. In one situation, it's when a brother in Christ stops continuing in the kindness of God. And so two different situations can occur. One of those is when a fellow Christian sins against me or I sin against him or her. The Lord says, here's what you do in that case. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take two or one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, 
let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here's a brother who is in sin. He sinned against me, or I've sinned against him. We try to work this out on our own. But if he refuses, the severity begins to come in. Take a couple of others. If that doesn't work, bring it before the church. If that doesn't work, God says, let him be like an outcast to you. Why? To make him angry? No. Why? To show him he's inferior? No. To try to show him what he's lost. And there's also a case when this happens on a congregational level. There was an example of this in the church at Corinth. And so the apostle said concerning this man who was in an inappropriate relationship, he said, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver the man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, you mete out a small amount of vengeance only in my name, only under my direction, not to make this brother some kind of of, uh, pariah who you never are going to associate with again, but to try to show him what he's missing in his relationship with God. Bring him back. In these situations, we must be very, very careful that we do this exactly as God has said. Now, sometimes this severity is also going to be seen toward those who are outside of Christ. And there are several passages in the New Testament that point us in this direction. Let me just mention one here. When the apostle said to the Corinthians, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? He's saying here there are times when you have just got to steer clear of those outside of Christ because they're going to pull you in the wrong direction. And so there is a a picture here of separation, of the severity that we find of God, but always under His guidance. So whether it's a brother in Christ or whether it's someone who is on the outside, God is saying, I may use you to kind of pull the tension a little bit tighter to show the severity side in order to get this brother or this person outside of Christ in the right relationship. But let me reiterate, no matter the situation, it is never about me. It's never motivated by pride. It's never motivated because I've got my feelings hurt. It's never motivated by personal desire. It is always, always in the instruction of God and for a holy purpose out of love for a brother to try to straighten him up or out of love for a sinner to try to bring him into the fold of God. Therefore, I must always proceed with caution. So here are the two sides. Showing kindness, which is the overarching point really of both of these, of helping someone. But yet to show kindness in continuing in my relationship with God. And as a part of that, showing kindness to my brother. On the other hand, understanding the severity of God that God will not Welcome those in who refuse him. When these two lines of tension are applied to my life, I can then be what God desires for me to be. And so the question that each of us has to ask is this, where do I stand in this tension? Am I allowing one side more tension than the other? Do I have this view that God is angry and mean and severe? If I do, I'll never love him. Because I don't think he loves me. On the other hand, do I think that God is is never going to punish, that God's never going to visit iniquity? If that's the case, I don't have a lot of respect for his standards. Thus, I look at this and I ask myself, do I know who God is? And I hope the answer to that is yes. But if you look at your life and you understand that you've kind of been treating God in an unkind way, that you've been either forsaking him or 
not obeying him or thinking bad thoughts about him, that this will be helpful in correcting those. And certainly if you understand that you're outside of Christ, you need to become a Christian. To know that love, to know that kindness that Father, Son, and Spirit have been working for you. And that can be done by being buried in the waters of baptism. Or if I'm a wayward Christian, if I've kind of cut the line, so to speak, and I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction, I can still seek God's forgiveness, and the prayers of saints will be helpful in that. The strangeness of times means we may not can deal with that in a more traditional way, but I assure you we can find a way to help you in getting your life right with Him. And if that's the case, you simply need to contact me or one of the elders of this church, and we'll make that happen. Thank you so much for joining us for this study today. I ask you to continue in prayer for our country that this illness can be healed, that those who are sick can be healed. I ask that you also pray about the tensions within our country that are not good tensions right now. That we can love one another, that we can be patient with one another. Whatever the case for all of us, let's remember that this world is not our home. And that the things that seem so pressing and so important today that in the day of eternity will not seem so at all. Let's make sure that we're ready for that day. Thank you again for joining us for this study.